Welcome back to Couch Confessions with me, Dr Dawn. I'm at the Barn Theatre in Sirencester, behind the barn door, and this week's guest is a very special lady who works tirelessly for the County of Gloucestershire, and she's also a dear friend. It's the Countess Bathurst. Lady B, thank you so much, because I know you are so incredibly busy. That's quite all right. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was slightly, just a little bit late tonight, but then that's been my yeah. middle name. You're, you're fantastic, and, and we really appreciate you giving us some time, because I know you're fantastically busy. Um, I could start anywhere, really, because you do so much for the county, but let's start with being High Sheriff. I was there at your ceremony, which was really quite special. Can you take us back to how that came about, how you were approached um, and how you made the decision to say well, yes? Well, the, the position of High Sheriff is, is I mean, it's a huge privilege um, and um, you are invited to do it. It's not sort of a, a voting thing. And, um, but I, I knew five years previously that before um, that I was going to be High Sheriff in 16, 17 and I had to keep it a secret for three years, which was really hard because I'm hopeless at keeping secrets. And you sort of, it's a tap on the shoulder. Um, you know, the serving high sheriff, Mark Hayward, came to see me and uh, asked to see both my husband and I. And he was talking about the high sheriff. And, um, and he said, uh, and he looked at me and he said, um, well, we'd actually like you to be high sheriff. And just for a moment, I sort of went, I almost looked over my shoulder to see if he was talking to somebody behind me because I thought, me, you know, why me? Um, so it was a, a huge honour to be asked and, and I was really thrilled to do it. And so I had five years to plan. Um, and of course I didn't start planning until about a year before. <laughs> it's typical because life took over. But it was, a, as you say, you were there at the, um, at the, uh, at the ceremony at, at Gloucester Cathedral and that was honestly the most special day I think for everybody. I think there were about 800 people in the cathedral and, and it was just... It was fantastic. It's it was an that, amazing day. It was, it was just the most beautiful thing. And I felt almost as if I was getting married again, but this time to the county for a year. And so, you know, it's a pledge that I made and a commitment. And so I threw myself into it. And it was just the most extraordinary 12 months. And unfortunately, my husband missed half of it because he wasn't well. Um, but at least I had something to talk to him, uh, something to talk to him about when I went into the hospital every day. Um, but it was a whirlwind of activity and um, adventure and discovery and learning. And I hope I did a few good things along the way. Um, oh, wow, well, you did some been... amazing things along the way. Well, I don't know about that, but I mean, I think that, you know, see, the thing about High Sheriff is, is that you get... You know, you get to see the parts of your county that nobody else gets to see. So, you know, anything that you want to do, you can, you can do. And, of course, every door is open to you to go and explore if you so choose. And, and there was so much that I wanted to do. But I think that the one thing that I took away from the year was what an extraordinary county Gloucestershire is. It is just phenomenal. And I've always maintained that this country would not be anything... It, anything like its, it, its, its current self without the charity and without the community help that people give freely of their time. And it is the backbone of this country and it's the backbone of Gloucestershire. There are thousands of people, literally thousands of people, Dawn, in our county giving their time freely for other people and to help other people, whether it's food banks, whether it's a women's shelter, whether it's the Nelson Trust, whether it's helping young kids who are possibly exploring the boundaries of good behaviour a little too far, just, you know, helping to guide them back, whether it's helping ex-prisoners who um, are needing some, uh, some support going back into civilian life, whether it's, you know, going to all the high days and holidays of, of the year, which was fantastic. There was Gloucester Day, which was just hilarious and the most wonderful memory and we paraded through Gloucestershire there was it was Remembrance Day which is obviously very special to me because I'm a national vice president of the women's section for the Royal British Legion um, it was just it was phenomenal going to Bristol Zoo getting to cuddle at an albino hedgehog that was kind of cool <laughs> um, and just seeing the 
enormous amount of good work that goes on in this country that nobody knows about. And these are all unsung heroes. You know, we've been seeing in the last three months how fantastic the NHS is and, and the heroes that are there, and they are. And, but then there's the voluntary sector behind it. And it's really humbling to see how many people just go out and help. Mm. Um, and it's really, uh, it's amazing. My, and they're the heroes. I was able to go and meet them. I was able to thank them. But my goodness, you know, they're the ones who do it day in and day out. So really, they're the ones who deserve the accolade, not me. Oh, well, you're, you're very um, modest about it, Lady B. But you talk about, you knew for five years and you were in kind of planning for a year. So how much is it, you know, an open landscape that you can decide what you want to do and how much is slightly scripted? How do you go about deciding what your year is going to look like? Well, the High Sheriff of Gloucestershire is, uh, is or the High Sheriff of any county, is by tradition... Her Majesty's representative in the county. So you have the Lord Lieutenant, who is in the role permanently until they, they're 70, and then the High Sheriff, which is a notch below, so that's you know, my boss, um, who also uh, represents the Queen in the county for all things law. So very much supporting the police, with whom I have a, a wonderful relationship still now, you know, f four years later after, after the role finished. Um, who I think are just fantastic. It, I, I could talk to you for a week about how amazing the police are in this county, and they always will have my very vocal support. Um, but also the prisons, um, and also the magistrates' courts too, and, and the courts. And one of the fantastic privileges of being a high sheriff is, is that you go to sit with the judges, up with the judges, so you're up with the head boy, you know, along <laughs> sort of the, you know, and you get to see everything that happens in front of you, and it's fascinating. I think I'm a frustrated lawyer at heart. I'm either a frustrated lawyer or a frustrated police officer. I've, I've yet to decide, probably a bit of both. Um, but, but just seeing this, this, this wonderful sort of process of court proceedings, whether it's criminal court or chancery, um, and uh, Jamie Tabor, who was uh, recently retired as, a, as the county um, court judge, uh, he started off a wonderful thing called Get In Court, which is funded by the High Sheriff's uh, Fund because we raise, raise a bit of money during the year and it, and it funds this particular project. And what it does is it gets schools into court, into actual court proceedings. And so they sit there and they see a case unfolding. And it's nearly always a case where it's something perhaps that they might understand um, or perhaps be exposed to um, drugs or burglary. I'm not saying that they're, you know, for a minute that the children, are, but it's, it, it, it's sort of something that they can... It's somewhere that they could, you know... It, they it's could somewhere go. that they could potentially start to drift into and they, and they see this very serious stuff going on and, and I think it, it teaches them um, an, an awful lot. And there was another... Um, uh, project that Jamie led, which was to uh, get young people who were starting to get involved in gangs, and he would get them into court, and it was to try to stop knife crime. It was the fight against knife crime, and they would get a group of youngsters who were really starting to edge on the, on the, on the wrong side of the law and getting involved in that kind of lifestyle. And he would bring in paramedics, police, ex-prisoners, anybody who was really closely involved um, in knife crime, and they would stand up on the witness box and they would give their experiences of what it was like to be involved in that scenario. And it was very powerful stuff. And you see, you see these kids coming and have been a bit sort of, oh, you know, a bit sort of, you know, this is all a bit of a lark. But by the end of the session, they were all incredibly quiet and they they listened to people who were really closely involved with it. There was a paramedic, it was unbelievably moving and she was telling the story of uh, attending a stabbing and she was so overcome by the emotion of having to relive this dreadful experience, she passed out 
and, um, and had to be treated by her fellow paramedic because it was just such a, yeah. an emotionally draining thing to having, um, you know, attended a, an incident where a young person was stabbed and very sadly they died. And, and then there was a, another chap who used to be involved in crime, had gone to prison and was reformed. And he was just saying, you just don't do this. This is just really not good you know you're affecting your life you're affecting other people's lives you're affecting the lives of all these emergency service workers who have had to attend it's it, it is an enormous thing it's not you know it's not clever to carry knives um and there was a uh, also a, a young man whose friend had been killed murdered knife crime that was incredibly moving and so to be able to witness mm. things like that and and really positive changes being made to young lives within the county um, was uh, it was extraordinary and uh, just say a huge privilege yeah, you can hear the passion in your voice and um, I know one of the things that you really got involved with whilst you were high sheriff and have continued I think involvement is with with the prisons with women's prisons with the women's prison yes. yeah, Eastwood Park mm. yes I realized you see the thing is I have this theory and I don't know if it's right and I, and I could be completely wrong and I and, you know, I'm very open to be, to stand to be corrected but I, I really believe that an awful lot of people who go to prison don't do it because they're bad they do it because they've just never been given the chance to explore a more positive path in their lives and one of those positive paths in their lives is education and it is an extraordinary statistic, but up to 60% of the prisoners in this country are illiterate. They either can't read or they can't write. Now, can you imagine mm. not being able to do either of those two things? Can you imagine the difficulty of not being able to get a job because you can't read? You can't, just, I mean, not, not just the simple thing of going shopping. You can't read the ingredients on a box of cereal I mean you know you can't I mean it must be incredibly uh, um, a, a huge handicap and so I figured that for these ladies who are in Eastwood Park a lot of them could not read so I thought well there's something we can do about this and so I started off a book club and the first time I went in there I was terrified absolutely terrified big brave me terrified <laughs> And I went into the room and there were about 10 ladies in there and they were all saying, they all had their arms folded, they were sort of looking me up and down like this, you know, and I'm thinking, I'm, I'm so dead, <laughs> you know, this is not going to go well. And I sat down and I introduced myself, I said, I'm the high sheriff, and they sort of, what's that? So I explained to them what it was. And I said, I really want to help you. I really want to be able to open up a whole new world. Your, your world at the moment is really narrow because you can't read. Your, your world is your existence. But if you learn to read, it opens up the entire world to you. And not only the current world, but wonderful history and, you know, discussion and politics and, you know, all those amazing things. And, and, and this will give you a chance to actually make something of your life because your mind will be open to your mind. You can explore any way you want with a book. So we started off, um, and it was my choice, we started off with the other Berlin girl. Um, which is one of my favourite books, and, and it was great, they loved it, because the first paragraph, I think the Duke of Buckingham gets his head lopped off, so they thought <laughs> that was all right. And, um, and, and, but, but before we started, I went round each individual person, and I said, why would you like to learn to read? What is your reason for being here? And so they went round, and you know, some were, I'm trying to improve my English, I just want to be able to get a job, but there was a one girl, Tanya, her name, her name was, she was a pretty girl, um, maybe 23, 24. And um, I always forget, she had lovely green eyes and she was such a sweetheart. And she's the sort of thing, sort of person you look, what are you doing in here? Mm -hmm. you know, and she just followed the wrong path and got in with the wrong people. And she looked at me and she just, her, the tears welled up in her eyes. She said, I just want to be able to um, read my little boy a bedtime story. And that just broke my heart yeah. so I said we're going to get you reading and the day that she 
read the first page aloud in a book club, I could have cried. It was amazing. Oh, you're making me feel... I, I, I know, I'm sure... I know, I'm welling up just thinking you know, You're it. completely right. I remember talking to a, a lady uh, many years ago. She's a, a life coach, and she uh, said she'd made an awful lot of money uh, making rich people richer you know, yeah. um, helping people to be more driven and she decided to change tack. And she tells a very similar story to you. She said she went to the, the ladies' prison in Manchester and she said as she left after the first day, as she walked down the hill, she said, there but by the grace of God, you know, if I'd turned a different way at a different time You're in my life, absolutely any right. one of us could be there. Absolutely yeah. right. And and. and you know, and so many of us are privileged. And, you know, and I had a very straightforward upbringing. You know, my parents worked extraordinarily hard to send me to a private school. Um, and, and I just think how lucky we are to have had a really good education. And, you know, and I, and I think that, you know, some of these girls, they were intelligent, they were funny, they were sassy, they had spirit. You just think, you know, I, I just, I, I genuinely don't understand why a really nice person like you is in here. And I, I just thought, yeah, this is because they've just not had, they've not had the right guidance, they've not been given the, the they've not got the opportunities. So let's, you know, let's do something about it. And. And then, you know, it's the confidence as well, it's self-esteem. Yeah. So you're not being able to read and write. Your self-esteem must be um, it just rock bottom. Mm. You know, to have to admit that you can't fill out a job application, you can't read the health and safety policy of somewhere where you've got a job, you know, it's... It's just not fair. So I, you know, I, I hope that I, I hope that it did some good. You just, of course, it did. You just mentioned your own childhood because you're not Gloucestershire born and bred, are you? Is it? No, Gloucestershire? I was actually born in Marlborough. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, across the border. So, what brought you to Gloucestershire? Um, well, my husband. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good reason. <laughs> um, uh, it was just so awkward, you know, me living down in Dorset and him being up here and us being married. No, I, I was living in Dorset. Um, met my husband. It was a blind date. No. Yeah, that was blind I didn't know that. Did you not know that? No, yeah, I didn't know that. Um, and, um, set up by whom? By... Set up by some mutual friends. Right. I didn't know who he was when I met him. OK. But when I found out who he was, I nearly ran a mile. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, he's, um, he's just the most wonderful, wonderful man. And I'm incredibly lucky. Um, so, yeah, now I came to Gloucestershire to, because I got married here. Yeah. Fantastic. And you talked, just you touched on it earlier, um, you know, of all, uh, a hideous time, um, your husband, um, mm. Earl Bathurst, was critically ill during your high sheriff year. Yes, um, that was I mean, fun. we were all kind of on a day by day vigil, really, weren't we, at the time? We were, we really were. Um, just, just if you can, if you can bear it, talk me through that. I mean, it was a, an amazingly busy time of your <coughs> life, and then suddenly your personal life is turned absolutely upside, upside down. down. Yes, well, he, he, I mean, he was very kind. He dialed it in at a really useful time because <laughs> he, he um, fell ill at the end of July and August is traditionally in the high sheriff year a very quiet month. So he was very good about that. But it was a high sheriff event. He got bitten on the hand by a deer fly. Um, and he'd never seen it before, so he let it have a bite so he could have a good look. Countryman. <laughs> Such a farmer. <laughs> Such a farmer. And, uh, and then he started feeling ill that night, and then the next day it was worse, and the next day it was worse, and then in the end we had to have a blood test taken, and I, you know, I got a call um, saying that he really needed to be in hospital. CRP levels, you, you know this, yes. Dawn. Uh, inflammatory levels and meant to be sort of between four and eight or something. Less when than they were five. In, less than five. I think his were 486 or something. Okay. And so, so he was said, really sick. So he was really sick. Um, so he went off and unfortunately there was a bit of delay before a, um, a diagnosis was made um, because of course that was in the days where people were still getting their heads around sepsis. Mm. And, um, and three, he went into the hospital on the Tuesday and on the Friday, he crashed and went into a coma. And I was in a coma for eight days. And that was a bit scary, I have to say. That was not a good time at all. And actually, I don't remember much about it. He remembers nothing about it, because I didn't know this. But when you're in a coma, you're given a drug that makes you forget everything. 
Well, often we induce a coma and we yeah. give you something called midazolam, which actually gives you um, an amnesia. Yeah. yeah. Which, you know, is, is... But the other thing we, we often say to people when, and I'm sure you were told, uh, when he was unconscious in intensive care. I used to work in intensive care at Gloucester Royal and I always used to say to relatives, you know, you must assume he can or she can hear you. Mm. Uh, because we do hear some amazing stories that even though often people have forgotten things, um, they will, there'll have been something that triggered a recovery. Yeah, you know, I, was, so. I was reading him a book um, for the week that he was in a coma. So I thought, mm. I can't just talk at him, poor chap. You'll just think, oh my goodness, you know, will you stop nagging woman? So I read <laughs> him a book and, um, and it was quite sweet because it was, I mean, obviously I was there pretty much sort of 18 hours a day. I'd go home and, you know, catch a bit of um, sleep and, and have something to eat and then get back to the hospital. And so I was reading him a book and the nurses in the intensive, um, in, 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 sorry, in the ITU um, were all sort of saying, we want to look after Lord Bathurst because we want to hear what happens next. <laughs> <In the book. laughs> really so they're not going but, to discharge him. Yeah, yeah, no, but interestingly enough, no, they don't want to wake him up until they got to the end of the book. But interestingly enough, he reread this book when he was better. And he'd never read the book before, and he said he remembered some of the bits in it. They were familiar to him. So it's yeah. very true what you say. Mm. Um, uh, but, but I had enormous support. I, mean, I had a, you know, a, a bunch of mates around me who were um, just incredibly, incredibly um, strong and supportive, and everybody at the estate was just absolutely brilliant. And he has made a phenomenal He recovery. has. He was in hospital for five months, so as I say, you know, he, he missed... He missed the he missed most of my year, which was a real shame. Um, but you know, I had lots to tell him because I'd get to the hospital every day, and that's another interesting thing. It was a real self-learning period because um, I found I, I have this analogy, and it's called my bubbles analogy. And my analogy is this: that whoever we are, in whatever walk of life, we 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 whatever path we're, we're walking, we are all in our own little bubble. And whatever is going on in that bubble, of course, to us, is the most important thing in the world. It's the most, it's because it's, it's happening to us, it's personal. We are sentient beings. And every time I left the hospital to go home, I'd dri be driving down the road and I might see, I don't know, a young couple walking down the road holding hands or there'd be somebody on the phone talking, you know, and laughing or there'd be two guys sitting outside a pub, um, having a drink, and I literally want to get out of the car and punch them and say, how dare you be happy? Do you know that my husband is fighting for his life in that hospital? It's at Cheltenham. And, um, and then I'd say, well, have a word with yourself, Bathurst. You know, they may have just got engaged. Yeah. He might be phoning his mum because he's just got a promotion at work. Those two guys might be old army mates. They haven't seen each other for 30 years and they're catching up. So, you know, they're in their bubble and you're in your bubble. So. My analogy is this, is that we live in a bubble, but it's really important to stick your head up out of your bubble and realize that there are billions of other bubbles going on around you with everybody with their own problems, their own happiness, their own successes, their own failures, their own worries, their own you know, uh, 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 stresses. Um, and there's an awful lot of stuff going on from an awful lot of bubbles at the moment because of what we've just been going through with COVID. Mm -hmm. You know, and we get... We get a lot of letters from people asking for money and for help. And, you know, somebody said to me the other day, do you get sick of being asked for money? I said, no, because that's their bubble. Yes. That's the most important thing to them. And that's, well, you know, that's very... why they, they need help. Yeah. They don't realize that 50 other people wrote to you that week asking for help. That's their bubble. And I understand that. You know, you can't help everybody, but you just understand that they're reaching out to get some help. So maybe, I just think it's really important that you have a, yeah, a consciousness maybe about what's going that, on. Maybe understanding that is a help in itself. I think yeah. it's a really wise way of looking at it. And, you know, it's amazing to see Lord Bathurst 
being, I mean, you know, back on form. Um, you always said you wanted to marry a farmer. Yeah. Uh, most I people did. would not think of Lord Bathurst as a farmer, but having been with him when he's been around some of your tenant farmers, he is yeah. very hands-on, isn't he? He's unbelievably hands-on. When the cattle, he's out checking the cattle every day. We have a little herd of Gloucesters, which lots of people enjoy when they walk through the park. We had loads of calves this year. It was wonderful. Um, I think we had 14, 13 or 14 calves this year. Um, so he's up feeding those every day or, or checking them every day. He's very hands-on with the farm. And he's very proud of the estate. He's been, you know, he's, he's lived and breathed and slept and ate that estate for, well, 59 years. He won't like that, happy me telling you that. <laughs> and, you know, so, it, I mean, it, it, is, it, it is his very being. I mean, it runs in his veins. So, you know, people will see him quite often going out in the park and emptying the bins because that just needs doing and he's not going to not do it because he's Lord Bathurst. He just, if he sees a job, he just gets on and does it. And that's the wonderful thing about my husband is he's incredibly down to earth, incredibly kind um, and very compassionate. And I think having, having met some of your farmers, it's something that they very much appreciate. You're incredibly generous as a couple with your with the park. How many acres is, is Siren Sister Park? 15,000. 15,000. Yeah, so your back garden is quite large mm -hmm. and you share it very generously with the county um, and we all enjoy, you know, you're very, very, very generous. You were particularly generous to me one year, about four years ago, um, and, I, and we are forever indebted to you. We did a, what we called a secret party. That's right. Um, yes, that's uh, right. Raising funds for the Star College in yeah. Cheltenham. And you very kindly uh, gave us Siren Sister Park, the house, uh, for 200 guests to come. And I do remember Lord Bathurst saying to my partner, Jack, at 11 o'clock in the evening, he said, I appear to have just paid for a beer in my own drawing room. <laughs> <laughs> and that, to me, is Lord and Lady B. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, incredibly yeah. generous. Yeah, I, no, I know. We, um, I mean, we, the park has always been open to the public, and we're incredibly um, proud to share it with the, with the community and for visitors who come to Sarah because it's a beautiful place. I mean, I think it'd be a bit selfish to... <laughs> Not sure, right, frankly. Um, but I think particularly in COVID, we were really, really happy to keep it open. And when the lockdown happened on the 23rd of March, we both looked at each other and said, whatever happens, we have got to keep the park open. Because we knew that people would be desperate to get out for a bit of fresh air, a bit of green, a bit of quiet, a bit of peace. You know, mental health has been a real issue through this, you know, these last three or four months. Um, and so it's been a place of tranquility and um, just escape and, I, and it is for us too I mean I go out in the evenings when the parks closed um, at five o'clock and I go out with the dogs and that's my downtime that's you know when I get to walk and think and you know just chill and your dogs are very special I love your dogs your They're dogs great. are very special to you yeah they are and yeah. how many have you got is it five six six yeah six six yes they are all of varying sizes and um, breeds and uh, and different characters they're wonderful yeah no they're they're lovely and they just never you know they don't matter if you've got they don't care if you've got lipstick on they're just like you're gonna go for a walk then you know and they know that going for a walk and when i went out came out this evening to come here um you know they saw my handbag and I went, oh that's not good <laughs> i normally i normally take them for a walk about now i said oh darling and they know the phrase stay here and look after the house and they're like oh Go back, they get Bless back to their them. beds and they look all grumpy, you know, they're like, oh, that's so, that's so sad. But I, I'll probably nip them out later on because it's still lovely light evening, so I'll give uh, them a run. You're, you're so sweet, Lady B, because I know you've had an incredibly, just so busy, you go from meeting to meeting to meeting. Um, what's new, what's next for Siren Sister Park? Well, funny you should mention that because, um, you know, the house is a big house and... Um, Am I right we, in saying you don't know how many rooms it is? I, I can never remember. <laughs> I can never remember. And actually, does it matter? People say, how many rooms does your house have? I don't know. You know, a few. Um, but we are, the house has not been really sort of open to the public before. But the 21st century has caught up and it's an expensive place to run. So I am going into, this is, oh, this is so much fun. Um, actually, I'm quite looking forward to it. We, we are going to start doing weddings, but very okay. limited. So, you know, really, really special. 
I only buy maybe at half a dozen a year. I don't want to put in a revolving door, so, mm. you know, it'll be, you know, half a dozen weddings a year. And, um, and maybe some sort of lovely sort of niche corporate events within the house um, and uh, see how, just to help pay the bills. And I'm, 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 even, I'm even playing with the idea of doing posh B&B. Oh, how wonderful. But we'll see. I don't know. We'll have You'll to have a that. very long list of people interested in I that. I know. Well, sure. it'll be quite fun because they, they can come and stay and, you know, they'll have this sort of own little private room and probably a sitting room. And then in the morning, we'll give them a lovely breakfast and I'll show them around the house and give them a bit of a tour. Well, perhaps it's a natural extension from B Bino is your coffee shop. Bino, I know. Lovely Bino. I love Bino. That was an idea that I had a, a few years ago and just because of... You know various things I couldn't I couldn't do it, high sheriff and etc. And um, and so two summers ago I think it was uh, two years two years old now I suddenly thought you know what I'm going to do this so I got online and found myself an old beaten up horse box <laughs> and um, because you know you can buy ready made coffee places on the on online but they're a fabulous amount of money I mean really expensive you know 12 14 grand and I thought Pfft, that's not going to happen. Um, and they also, they weren't quite perfect. And I knew really what I wanted. So I thought, no, I'm just going to buy a horse box. Local carpenter came and did it out for me inside. And we painted it and shoved it in the park. And we've been serving coffee and homemade cakes to everybody ever since. And I absolutely love it. You know, I sort of, you know, I, I work hard at it behind the scenes. And I've got lovely Debbie and Mo. And Ella has just joined us. And so they, they're the face of Beano. And I just sort of supply them with cakes. A milk, you know, and get an emergency call. Need more milk? On my way. Oh, <laughs> Lady over to Tesco's you, and get some more milk. You are an amazing ambassador <laughs> for the county, and I love what you do. Oh, um, very sweet. I know that those dogs. I love your dogs, and I don't want to irritate them by by the missing. No, they, they will so, be going. <laughs> seriously. <laughs> so I'm going to let you go. But before before you probably actually, to be fair, pretty much answered this. What I wanted to ask you is what yourself today would tell your younger self? I suspect it might have something to do with a bubble. I think it's got something to do with the bubble. And also, I think what I would tell my younger self is don't let life take you over. And the one thing, and I think a lot of people would agree with me, that over the COVID shutdown, lockdown, our diaries have been empty. And, you know, it's just lovely being able just to be mm. at home, quiet, nothing in the diary, having the freedom to do projects in the house. And my goodness, have I got some projects to do in the house, <laughs> archives and goodness knows what. Um, but also just to be, you know, I'm very, I'm very, I live with my husband seven days a week, 365 days a year, because we never go away and we never go on holiday. Um, just don't have time. But it was just really nice to spend some proper quality time together and just be. And I think that what I would tell myself if I was now 18, I would say, don't let your diary get so full that you don't have time just to be. Because that's really what I've learned in the last three months. And I'm going to listen to myself now and carry that forward and structure my diary much more so that actually it's not the tail wagging the dog, but a little bit the way, other way around. Thank you. What a great piece of advice. Yeah. What an amazing lady. Thank you, Lady B, for that interview. And thank you all for listening and watching. And uh, we'll be back next week. But until then, please stay safe and stay well. <laughs>